Welcome to Moving Medicine, a podcast by the American Medical Association. In today's episode, AMA immediate past president, Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld, is joined by panelists to discuss new telehealth licensing models for physicians. In part one of this two-part series, panelists Kimberly Horvath, a senior attorney at the AMA, and Jared Augenstein, managing director at Manat Health Strategies, provide background on state licensure as it stands. Be sure to tune in to part two of this conversation and subscribe to AMA Moving Medicine on your favorite podcast platform. Here's Dr. Ehrenfeld. I'm Jesse Ehrenfeld, and I'm so delighted to serve as your host today. Today, we're going to talk about legislative, regulatory, and other advocacy efforts to support telehealth, in particular, issues around state licensure. We're going to do that with a panel of experts who are going to help us understand the current landscape of state licensure for telehealth and what's ahead. Now, as we all kind of learned during the pandemic, telehealth is an essential part of medical practice today. It can be a lifeline for patients, particularly those with limited mobility, those in rural, economically or socially marginalized communities, and those who are managing a chronic illness. One of the primary factors fueling telehealth expansion during COVID-19 was the easing of the many restrictions that had previously applied to virtual care. If you think back prior to March of 2020, Medicare only reimbursed a limited number of telehealth services And it did so only for patients who resided in rural areas and who had traveled to a medical facility to receive them. The AMA, we led the fight to lift those and other limitations so that patients nationwide could access telehealth services and get them in their own homes. A subsequent survey showed that 85% of responding physicians now embrace telehealth services. When the COVID-19 public health emergency ended in May, Ensuring that new policies enabling telehealth expansion would remain in place became an AMA priority. Our advocacy helped secure passage of federal legislation that's extended these pandemic-related telehealth flexibilities through 2024. And we are enthusiastic supporters of the Connect for Health Act of 2023. This is a bipartisan proposal now pending in Congress that would further expand Medicare coverage of telehealth services while making pandemic-related flexibilities permanent. And because the role of telehealth in the U.S. healthcare delivery is likely to gain even more prominence going forward, we are working at the AMA to ensure that physicians have all the tools, the resources, and the support that they need to more seamlessly integrate telehealth into their workflows. And we're working to make sure that patients have access to those physicians. So let's go ahead and dive in. I am so delighted to introduce an incredible panel of today's leading experts. First, we've got Clark Baranow, who is an Assistant Vice President of Government Affairs at the Medical Society of Virginia, where he directs their advocacy efforts as chief lobbyist. Clark is a leading public affairs professional with a proven track record of results in government relations, social media advertising, regulatory affairs, crisis communications, and organizational strategy. Welcome, Clark. Next is Marshall Smith. Executive Director of the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, which provides an expedited process for physicians to become licensed in multiple states. With more than 20 years of government management experience, Marshall brings a wealth of insight, medical health licensing laws and regulations. The compact has been a leader in helping physicians obtain licensure in multiple states, and he's gonna share some insights from their work with us today. Welcome, Marshall. Next, I've got Dr. Sarvam Takanda, a plastic surgeon at the Mayo Clinic and the immediate past chair of the Federation of State Medical Boards. His medical expertise includes published research on virtual care and telemedicine, including an article, Payment and Coverage Parity for Virtual Care and In-Person Care, How Do We Get There? Welcome, Sarvam. We also have Jared Augenstein, Managing Director at Manat Health Strategies, where he works with healthcare providers on strategy digital health, telehealth, and delivery system transformation. Jared has a lot of experience helping large health systems, academic medical centers, and children's hospitals with strategic planning, transformation, and population health infrastructure development. Welcome, Jared. And finally, we've got Kimberly Horvath, a senior attorney at the AMA, where she provides legal oversight for our legislative and advocacy goals at the state level. 
Kimberly has over 15 years of experience in healthcare advocacy and is a valued leader in helping us advance the mission of our organization. Welcome, Kim. I'm now gonna turn things over to Kim and Jared. Great. Thanks, Dr. Ehrenfeld. It's uh, great to be with the AMA and this esteemed uh, panel today. We're looking forward to, to the discussion. So as, as Dr. Ehrenfeld mentioned, uh, uh, Kim and I are going to provide a, a bit of an overview of the state of play in telehealth licensure. Uh, Kim's going to provide a deep dive on specific state approaches, and then we're going to get into a, a panel discussion for, for most of the time today. So I thought I would start by just providing a little bit of historical context on how we got where we are today related to state licensure and in particular state licensure in the, in the context of the world in which we're living in where, where an increasing number of services are being delivered via telehealth. Um, I think it's important to note that going all the way back to 1791, the Bill of Rights granted states the right to regulate health. Now, you know, since that time, there's been a huge variability uh, that's emerged in terms of the size, structure, and authority of medical boards. Some are independent, other medical boards are integrated into larger state agencies like state departments of health, and most medical boards combine uh, a representation from physicians and also members of the public. Now, fast forwarding you know, a couple hundred years uh, to 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic, to meet the increased demand for care, and in many cases, supply and demand imbalances uh, that existed across the country. You'll remember during the first few waves of COVID, there might be significant spikes in certain parts of the country where there were lulls in other parts of the country. So for a while, we were really trying to manage this huge mismatch in supply and demand across the country. And in light of that, um, many states, all states in fact, uh, provided some sort of flexibility related to licensure. Uh, in many states, licensure requirements, components of licensure requirement were, were waived. Uh, in many states, there were broad reciprocity waivers that were implemented, which essentially permitted physicians and other healthcare professionals with an active license in good standing in one state or territory to provide uh, care in another state without going through the process of obtaining an in-state license. There were also some cases, uh, states in which uh, telehealth specific exemptions were implemented, which allowed out of state providers to deliver care in state via telehealth without an in state license. Now, many of these flexibilities were tied to state declarations of, of emergency. And so now, fast forward to uh, three or three and a half years later, uh, nearly all states have lifted the temporary flexibilities that were, were implemented during the height of the pandemic. There's only a small handful of states that still have flexibilities tied to their state declarations of emergency. But states are now in a position of trying to explore, you know, what policies that we implemented should we keep? Um, what should, you know, should we revert to the kind of pre, pre-COVID norm? And how do we make sense of, uh, you know, telehealth licensure and, and, and telehealth licensure and registration in, in the context of an evolving healthcare system. So, and there's been some guidance um, that, that's emerging from national organizations such as the AMA, um, FSMB, which we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll hear about, uh, and also the Uniform Laws Commission related to potential models for cross-state licensure, state-by-state -state licensure, and also uh, the provision of telehealth across state lines. So I'm going to provide a, a high level overview of four different models that are emerging related to licensure for cross state practice and telehealth services. And then Kim's going to go and provide state by state examples for each of these. So the first of these models is uh, interstate compacts. And as Dr. Ehrenfeld noted, uh, you know, we're going to discuss today the IMLC, uh, which is the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. Um, there, I will note that there are other compacts for other licensed health professionals, nurses, psychologists, audiologists, speech language pathologists, and others. Um, and the IMLC in particular creates an expedited licensure pathway for physicians to deliver either in-person or telehealth services in more than one state. Um, more than half of, of states are, are signatories to the IMLC at this point, I think more than 35 states. And, um, and that, that's one of the, the first pathway that uh, is emerging. 
The second is licensure by endorsement or reciprocity. This provides an expedited pathway for physicians to obtain a full license in one state based on a set of qualifying criteria in that state um, and offers an expedited pathway to full licensure. The third pathway here, special purpose telehealth registries or licenses, these are in addition to uh, or in lieu of a full license. These are special licenses or registrations that enable a physician or other licensed professional, depends on the state, uh, who's, who's fully licensed in one state to obtain a special license to deliver telehealth services to in-state residents, often with some restrictions in place. Uh, these licenses or registrations are often less expensive or faster to obtain. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the theory behind the emergence of these types of models and a handful of, of states offer these uh, licenses or registrations and, and Kim will provide some examples in a moment. And then finally, exceptions to in-state licensure requirements. So within the context uh, of, of, a full, of a full license, there are certain states that are allowing physicians who are licensed in one state to deliver services via telehealth and in more limited cases in person to patients in that state without uh, being licensed in that state under certain circumstances, such as in a case of emergency or follow-up care. Um, and again, there are, there are a range of different um, exceptions that are being explored and implemented in different states, and, and, and we'll discuss some of those as well. So that hopefully gives a kind of lay of the land in terms of history and what some of the emerging models are. I'm going to hand it over to, to, to Kim, who's going to uh, go one level deeper on each of these four models and provide some more specific examples. Kim? Thanks, Jared. Great. Thanks so much, Jared. Um, great overview. As Jared said, I'm just going to dive in a little bit more. I'm not going to talk too much. I'm not going to talk about the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact because we have Marshall here who's going to provide a lot more information there. But um, so I'm going to start with licensure by endorsement. Um, it, this is not a new approach. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. And it's not limited to cross-state licensure for telehealth, um, but it can be used for that purpose. And, and in fact, there are lots of states that have had licensure by endorsement in place even before the public health emergency. Basically, these models offer, as, as Jared said, a streamlined process for physicians licensed in another state to obtain licensure in a state if they meet certain requirements. And Virginia is a good example of a state that has a licensure by endorsement process. Physicians who meet certain requirements as laid out here can apply um, for licensure in uh, Virginia based on their existing state license in another state. And before I move forward, let me just make an important point. And that is that states are not limited to one of these models that we're talking about here. And in fact, states like Virginia have several of these models in place. Many states are members of the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, but also may have some exceptions to licensure. They may have a reciprocity agreement. So again, you're not limited and states are not limited to one of these models. Um, now, picking back up the models. So licensure by reciprocity is another thing that I think that we're actually going to see more and more of. Um, especially as states really start to dive into and really get a handle on who their patients are seeing. Um, are they seeing physicians? And I think what we're seeing is that they're actually, when they're receiving telehealth services, it's often from a physician just across the border of their state. So I think we're going to see a lot more reciprocity with, um, with, with states that, um, that, are, that, that, that share borders. Um, like we have for Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. Um, I imagine that we'll start to be seeing that. But basically, this approach, it doesn't necessarily allow a physician to automatically receive a license um, in that state. So the process, for example, that Virginia, D.C., and Maryland came up with is that it is a very much more expedited, streamlined process for a physician who is licensed in one of these jurisdi just jurisdictions to be licensed in one of the other jurisdictions. Um, it is aimed at minimizing the administrative burden for both the physician, but also, frankly, the state medical board. Um, and then working together, the three of these states can 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 um, can do that. And I, like I said, I imagine we'll see this in some other states. Um, Jared mentioned the special purpose telehealth registry or license. There are about a half a dozen states that currently have a special telehealth registry um, or license in their state. Florida being one of the first states to enact this type of model and actually did so before COVID. Um, while requirements will vary by state, of course, 
um, typically they have some of the same requirements that Florida does. And that is um, the physician who is looking to have a special telehealth license in Florida, um, it is limited to telehealth. That physician cannot have an in-state physical address. They cannot provide in-state services. They must also have a registered agent in the state and also need to have needs to have liability coverage for telehealth services provided in the state. Um, again, I think that we'll continue to see states adopt this type of model. As Jared mentioned, the Uniform Laws Commission has a model registry process as well. Many states have an exception to lic licensure specifically for providing telehealth in certain circumstances. And again, even before the pandemic, states have had in place exceptions to licensure in response to an emergency, or if a physician is consulting with a physician in another state who has an existing patient-physician relationship with the patient whom the physician is consulting on. Um, so in those instances, physicians don't need to have a license to practice in those states. But I think we're starting to see um, an uptick in interest in states looking at some other very narrow exceptions to licensure. And this is actually something that the AMA supports um, when we're talking about continuity of care. Um, so for example, where a physician um, is providing ongoing or follow-up care to a patient that happens to be in another state temporarily or for a limited period of time, we're talking about college students, we're talking about snowbirds um, who may be you know, elderly, who maybe live in Arizona or Florida for part of the year. Um, but those are the kind of the, the types of populations that this can really have a positive impact on. And again, in those instances where that physician is providing follow-up care or ongoing care for that patient, they would not need to be licensed in the state um, via this exception. And again, I think it is something that we will continue to see. It's something that the AMA supports, and it's something that we actually have model legislation on as well. And it's a good segue to the AMA perspective here. And we have lots of policy on telehealth. Um, this policy is really limited to our policy focused on licensure. Um, important, important to just kind of note at the outset that we continue to support a state-based licensure system. Policies that physicians and other healthcare professionals must be licensed in the state where the patient is receiving care um, when they are receiving the services, right? Um, and that is um, also because we believe that physicians and other healthcare professionals have to abide by state licensure laws, but also the Medical Practice Act and all other laws in the state where the patient is located. The AMA has long supported the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. As I mentioned, we support exceptions, some of those limited exceptions that I mentioned earlier. And of course, we encourage states to facilitate telehealth for continuity of care to preserve that critical patient-physician relationship that I mentioned. And with that, uh, Dr. Ehrenfeld, I will pass it back to you to get started with the panel. Awesome. Jared, Kim, thank you so much for uh, setting the stage for us. So let me start with um, Dr. Turkanda. Part of the rationale for state-based licensure is to ensure patient protections. That is, a patient has a clear pathway and a mechanism to report an issue to the state medical board for consideration and action. What role do you see the state medical boards playing in the regulation of cross-state telehealth practice, and how can state medical boards ensure patient safety and provider accountability? So thank you, Dr. Ehrenfeld, and uh, thank you to the AMA for allowing me to participate. Um, you know, state medical boards have uh, really the statutory duty to protect the public. But uh, given the changes in the regulatory challenges and patient safety concerns, we're having to adapt the in-person provision of medical care to this newer model of telehealth care. Um, this, the one thing that's important is that the standard of care does not change with the modality and should remain reasonably consistent across states. We realize that the standard of care um, can be regional. Uh, regional. In the regulation of cross-state telehealth practice, state medical boards should provide some guidance and achieve some reasonable consensus on some of the broader issues, such as, number one, harmonizing regulations to facilitate telehealth across state lines while maintaining patient safety. We should also uh, establish clear guidelines and requirements for healthcare providers who wish to protect this pra practice telehealth across state lines. This includes uh, ensuring that providers are appropriately licensed and credentialed to practice in the state where the patient's located and verify the qualifications and the credentials of those providers. In addition, state medical boards should ensure that providers offering telehealth services are aware and 
uh, aware of and compliant with state-specific laws and regulations governing telehealth practice. Um, state medical boards also have the responsibility of establishing clear and accessible mechanisms for patients to file complaints regarding telehealth services. And this is all part of making that cross-state licensure efficient. Um, when a complaint is re uh, received, state medical board should have the authority and resources to investigate the matter thoroughly, even if it's across state lines. Uh, this may involve reviewing medical records, conducting interviews, and collaborating with other state agency. Um, I think importantly in the long term, state medical boards have the responsibility of monitoring and evalu evaluating cross-state practices. Um, there should be periodic assessments of the telehealth practices and regulations so that we can adapt to the evolving healthcare landscape. Um, you know, as uh, Kim and uh, Jared mentioned, there are a variety of approaches to facilitate interstate, interstate license portability. Um, I think, uh, Kim, you had mentioned that the, the, the INLC and permanent licenses, there are currently 23 states and the District of Columbia that have permanent interstate telemedicine mechanisms in place in addition to the IMLC. Nine states plus the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands use telemedicine or special licenses. Uh, uh, nine states also use registration or waiver systems. Um, three states in uh, District of Columbia use a regional reciprocity approach or a memorandum of understanding. Utah, in fact, allows a pro bono interstate telemedicine license uh, and there are two or, uh, two states that allow for consultative services only. Um, regarding, you know, ensuring patient safety and provider accountability, um, you know, the relationship between the physician and the patients is based on a mutual understanding of shared responsibility. You know, defining when uh, when the relationship begins can be sometimes difficult, but the relationship is, is clearly established when the physician agrees to undertake the diagnosis and treatment of the patient, and the patient agrees to be treated. Um, to protect patients, we have to ensure that the practitioner uses telemedicine to meet the same standard of care and professional ethics as a practitioner using traditional in-person encounters. From a board perspective, you know, we see the failure to follow standard of care or professional ethics. Um, that may subject the practitioner to a discipline uh, by a medical board. Um, I think one of the things to ensure a patient is to have the appropriate patient informed consent uh, for the use of telehealth. Um, appropriate consent should at a baseline include simplistically the identification of patient, patient location, identification of physician, their own credentials, and the physician's state of practice. We also need to have an identification of the patient's primary care physician for continuity of care. Um, I think those are just the sim simple things from an informed consent uh, uh, practice. We also have to have patient uh, ensure patient privacy and make sure that that patient is being seen for uh, for uh, an established care. So I'll I'll stop at that point, uh, Jesse. Very very helpful to hear the perspective from FSMB. Um... That wraps up the first part of this two part series. Don't miss part two of the conversation. Subscribe to Moving Medicine Today. Thanks for listening.